Has our discomfort with uncertainty given rise to forecasting industries that profit off of our prediction addiction? Why are election predictions, polls and surveys specious and often wrong? And to what extent are predictions really just hypotheses that need to be challenged? I will explore these questions and much more with our very special guest, Margaret Heffernan, author of Uncharted, How to Navigate the Future. As technology evolves and we're really in the midst of a technological progress, doesn't technological progress make predicting the future, say, easier? <laughs> well, they will tell you so. Um, and and they'll be able to predict some things, for example, although everybody always complains about it, you know, weather forecasting has improved year after year after year. It's actually incredibly good. And if you had asked your grandparents, you know, what it was like, they would be amazed by the specificity that we we enjoy every day. Um so it's definitely got better, but there are all kinds of fundamental reasons why we can't um, be as confident of prediction as we think we can. For one thing, you know, there's this saying that history repeats itself, but actually it doesn't, right? And thinking that it does leads us into terrible errors. For example, you know, both Eisenhower and Johnson both believed that the Vietnam War was like Munich and therefore like the Second World War. Well, first of all, as we discovered to a very tragic cost, it was nothing like the Second World War. And as Robert McNamara has so painfully um, expressed, thinking it was is what led us to make such a whole stream of horrible strategic decisions. And thinking that it was also made us think that we really understood where we were, whereas in fact, we were really lost and confused. So history doesn't repeat itself, which has really significant um, consequences when we come to look at technology, because what's touted as AI uses historical data sets. So it's learning from past um, patterns in data and projecting those in the future. But what that does is it assumes that people don't change and that context doesn't change and that knowledge doesn't change. But actually, as we know all the time, it does. And in addition, you know, as we keep finding over and over again with some of the early um, attempts at AI, many data sets are um, incomplete. Many are horribly biased. Many of the algorithms designed to analyze them are very biased. So the notion, for example, as has been tried, that you can take a large data set of children requiring help from social services and therefore predict what children will have greater need. You know, this failed spectacularly because A, it didn't include lots of children who get help, but not from the the public sector. And it didn't um, include quite a lot of detail around age and circumstance. So, So even in those cases where we have a ton of data, you know, because it can't be everything, uh, it can't be everything about everybody, the stuff that gets left out has a huge impact on the results that are found, which often lead people in particularly the wrong direction. A perfect example is it rated the risk to a six-month-old left out in the winter as lower than the risk for a 16-year-old. The 16-year-old was deemed to be at greater risk because the 16-year-old had um, received help from social services more frequently. So the idea that we can get every piece of a gigantic puzzle perfectly tuned, I think, is noble, but probably absurd. So, Margaret, we hear, you know, elections, predictions, polls, surveys. Here in the States, we just went through a presidential election. Uh, there have been, you know, globally different um, referenda, or what have you, where predictions have been made and polls have been published and surveys have been drawn. And, you know, what we've noticed, and it's become evident to me, is that uh, they don't always tell you who wins, and they seem to be of late pretty inaccurate. Why is that the case? Well, I think, yeah, it is, and, it, and not just in the United States. Um, I mean, it's a problem for several reasons. One is because no two elections are the same. 
So if you apply the same methodology, you know, from an election where the polling worked, if you could find one, um, you know, there's no guarantee that that methodology will um, will work next time. And you even if you took this year's methodology and tweaked it to accommodate everything you've learned since. By the time we get to the next election, all sorts of other things may have happened, which your algorithms and so on still don't accommodate. So, you know, this is a moving target. But it's also, of course, and we've known this since, you know, Gallup started doing surveys at the beginning of the century, really. People don't always tell the truth. The people you choose to do your polling with, you think you know, you know, how representative they are, but you don't know everything about them. And the thing is, especially when you're dealing with really tiny margins of errors, these tiny distinctions and slip ups can have a disproportionate effect. So what's alarming about them is that they they seem to give a level of certainty. But to some degree, you know, I have some sympathy for pollsters. To some degree, the fault is ours is in believing them. You know, which is, these are these are better understood as highly educated guesses, and it's our thinking that that somebody out there knows that I think is is our kind of weakness. You know, the the Greeks thought that crazy old women in caves knew. The Romans thought you could cut up birds and read their entrails. You know, we seem to have a kind of desire for magical belief in the future without grasping that since it hasn't happened yet, people don't know what it is. Very important, Margaret. Yeah, really interesting insights there. And I, I definitely agree with you on that. Here's the other side of that equation, though. So, so if we can't predict the future, how can we prepare for it? And, um, and I, you know, on that front, I'm quite buoyant. Um, and I've written a lot about organizations that prepare, I think, very well. But one reason that or very often organizations don't prepare well is because we've grown up, most of us, in a time and with a, in a context of thinking about management that thought that what you wanted to do was plan and planning was about optimizing efficiency. Efficiency is fantastic when you're dealing in environments where you have a lot of control, where they're quite linear and they are repetitive. So if you think of a car assembly line, you can pretty much predict it forward how many cars they're going to produce tomorrow, which is probably going to be strikingly similar to the number of cars they produce today. But once you start getting involved in more complex environments, efficiency will erode any margin you have to deal with shocks and surprises. So I think efficiency really gets in the way of preparing because preparedness is about robustness. And I distinguish robustness from resilience. Robustness means when something surprising happens, you could just keep going. It's why you have more, uh, more engines in a plane than you need and more operating systems in a plane than you need because you don't want to recover from the crash. You want the crash not to happen. You want the plane to be able to get through a geese strike or a bug in the operating system. So it's over-engineered. That's preparing. Resilience means, well, I have the capacity to bounce back, which in you know, less fatal circumstances might be good enough. But I think when you're working in a context of great uncertainty, which is true for many, many organizations these days, we have to think much more about robustness. What are the likely risks that will have a large impact on our business? And how do we build in buffers to deal with those? Margaret, one of the things I like about your book is that it's chock full of interesting anecdotes and compelling stories that illustrate the insights you're sharing. And, and one thing you point out in your book is that poor decisions derive from anxiety. And anxiety comes from a lack of control. How can we change this dynamic? And perhaps you could highlight the example you provide in the book around patient waiting rooms. I think this is a really beautiful story. I'm glad you picked it out. You know, there's a phenomenal exper experiment going on in Austin, Texas, where they're building a whole new healthcare system. And, um, and the people who are leading it 
really had have had great experience and insight in seeing that how patients feel in their relationship to their to everything in the healthcare system that they interact with impacts their judgment. So their big bet has been essentially that if you can improve the relationship between the patient and the healthcare institution, the patient will make better judgments, be more involved in their health care, be more likely to follow through, you know, with physiotherapy and diet and be all the behavioral stuff. And therefore the outcomes will be better and cheaper. And so this this healthcare center, the Dell Medical Center, was really set up to to test this to the hilt. And so when they were designing the building, they said, well, you know, hospital waiting rooms are, and I can vouch for this. <laughs> Uh, are some of the most awful, dreary places in the world. And they make everybody anxious because you look around thinking, you know, am I, do I look as terrible as that guy? Uh, you know, and gee, everybody here is much older than I am. You know, am I really in trouble? And I mean, we all know they're terrible places, right? So they said, okay, so we want a hospital that where there are no waiting rooms. And all the architects said, you can't do that. Uh, it's never been done, and there are, here are all the 57 reasons why you need uh, waiting rooms. They said, no, we didn't come here to do what everybody else is doing. We want to do something different. And they said, well, show us the data that shows this will work. And they said, but you can't have data about the future, right? There are no data sets for what nobody's ever done before. Uh, anyway, took it was a two-year battle, and they eventually designed, and I've been there, you know, this exquisite hospital where you were checked in and you go straight to essentially your suite, which is big enough to accommodate your family or whoever you want to bring with you. It doesn't have this rather intimidating table, you know, right in front of you where you think you're going to be forced to lie down and expose yourself. They, there's a table that can turn into that if you need it, but why frighten people before you absolutely have to? There's room for kids and stuff. And all the doctors come to the patients. So instead of a very hierarchical system, which is, you know, you come to my office, in my time, and you're a guest in my space, and you do what I tell you, this is your space, and the doctors and the nurses and the radiographers and so on, they all come to you. And the people you need with you to feel comfortable, they can stay to the degree that you want them to. And the doctors have done quite a lot of work on how to talk to patients to capture really good information about their psychological state by having a good kind of human conversation with them. And they've even tested, for example, the difference between what they learn if they ask, is there anything else I can help you with versus is there something else I can help you with? But they really have put a lot of effort into communication. And the upshot of all of this is what they found is that they can treat people more cheaply with better outcomes by focusing on the relationship between doctors, other medical practitioners, and the patients. And the other thing they do, which I think is brilliant, is, you know, they're absolutely not averse to technology, but they, instead of buying stuff off the shelf and then having everybody bend to the will of it, you know, they paper prototype everything and then get exactly what they think will serve the way that they want to do medicine. I mean, it's it's a really awe-inspiring kind of font of incredible creative thinking. So, Margaret, you do a wonderful job of explaining and introducing scenario planning and distinguishing it from forecasting. Why is scenario planning more useful than forecasting? And how important are such questions as what if and so what in scenario planning? Yeah. So I think scenario planning is a, a really deeply fascinating process um, for a number of reasons. The first is that, you know, the essence of scenario planning is it's about getting a very diverse group of people together from multiple disciplines to posit on the basis of, you know, plausible information, possible futures. It is not to pick one. It is to be able to identify that it is plausible that any of the, fo the following three or four scenarios could happen, not to put probabilities against them, but to ask the crucial question, which is, if scenario one were to come true, 
what would we wish we had been doing now? If scenario two were to happen, what would we wish we had been doing now? So they are fantastic examples of thinking about preparedness. And what they do is they throw up options. They put people, if you like, mentally in these different plausible futures and say, okay, scenario two just happened. What do you do? What do you wish you'd been doing right now? And then they look at all of those options and say, okay, of those, what are the things we could be, should be doing now anyway? And what are the opportunities that this exercise has really surfaced um, in terms of what we can do together, what we can do differently? And I think they're very much more creative and deeply more enlightening than the many board meetings I've sat in where, you know, executive A says, I think this is going to happen. And executive B says, I think that's going to happen. And you have a total stalemate because neither of them knows. And it is about surfacing options. And the other thing I think, which I didn't realize until I I started interviewing some of the kind of doyen of scenario planning, is that they really change the culture because they are about thinking about possibilities. There's no absolute truth. They derive a lot from quite a lot of fierce debate and so on. And so they do two things. They legitimize debate in a way that's very empowering for people. But they also make it possible to kind of come back and say, you know, that thing that we thought wasn't going to happen, I've seen a lot of things that suggest it might. Let's let's rethink this one. And, you know, changing one's minds in institutions can be deeply difficult politically. But if you share the experience of looking at possibilities and can call on that, it becomes a lot easier to be flexible and adaptable. Margaret, you point out in your book, preparedness is a vital anecdote to passivity and pessimism. Could you tell us what are the four components of preparedness that you outline in your book? And really where I'm, what I'm focusing on is the type of thinking uh, that is distinguished. Is the just-in-case thinking versus the just-in-time thinking? And how do they factor in to really effective preparedness? Right. So I encountered, um, in the course of my researches, I re- encountered this organization called the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, which is a bit of a mouthful. And I encountered it very early in its life because it was only created in 2017. Unfortunately, we'd all be better off if it had been created a lot earlier. And Richard Hatcher, who's the first director there, had this, I think, very brilliant insight, which is he said, you know, in an epidemic, there are kind of two modes of thinking. And one is the just in case, and this is fundamentally robust thinking. You know, this is um, what's the stuff that we need to be working on now, because if or when a, an epidemic strikes, we need it and we don't have time. And in this case, what he identified, you know, look, because you know, talking to people who spend their lives in epidemiology. In the middle of an epidemic, the one thing you absolutely want to have is a vaccine. That's the holy grail. So the organization started funding vaccine development three years ago. And they identified candidates of diseases that were most likely, and if they broke out, um, would have the most dire impact. And among the first candidates that they chose, fortunately for all of us, were Uh, beta coronaviruses. And what's very striking is that they did this because pharma, the pharma industry did not want to do it. You know, the pharma industry was not prepared to invest in things that might never happen. So this was just in case, and it was very inefficient because they were working on six diseases, some of which may never create epidemics. And many of the vaccine candidates won't work. Now, right now, with, you know, with coronavirus, this is spectacularly inefficient, but it's fantastically robust because it means we can be reasonably confident that out of those, there will be a number that work and maybe some that are better for some circumstances than others. So that was stuff where he says you have to start early and throw a lot at it. 
And then he said, there's the other kind of thinking, which is just in time, which is when you have an epidemic and if you have a vaccine, then you're going to have to move really quickly to mass manufacture that. So what you can do now is you can put all those contractual relationships in place. You can put the capital flows of, and of the availability of capital in place. But actually, you, when the moment hits, then you have to be able to work on a just-in-time, classic manufacturing assembly line methodology. And these two ways of working are perfectly compatible. And I think it's a really brilliant way of thinking about the future, which is what are the things, you know, if we're a company or even a family, what are the things that we should be doing just in case? Right? Families take out insurance. Um, lots of people buy fire extinguishers. They hope never to use either of these things, but they do it just in case. And then just in time, what are the things that we might have to do really quickly and do we know where to go for those when we need them? It shows that long-term thinking and short-term thinking are not mutually exclusive. They're completely compatible. Margaret, I speak to government executives and thought leaders about their view of leadership and how it's applied. I was wondering if you could elaborate on what is an adaptive leader? How important is it for that leader to have a tolerance for ambiguity? And what other characteristics are essential for today's leaders? I mean, it's a great question. I think the people I know who are tolerant of ambiguity have generally lived a l lives full of change. So they've, they've become, and the change has meant that they've had to adapt and they've become confident in their capacity to adapt and to improvise. Um, I think also, and this is, this is a sort of consistent theme in all of my writing, really. I think most organizations are jam-packed full of talent that is hideously underused. And so I think a key component of leadership in this age is the capacity to convene a very diverse group of people at every level and ask them hard questions and listen to the ideas and comments that come from every level. I have so often had the experience of having a grueling hard problem solved by somebody either working outside their domain expertise or kind of lost down in the bottom of the hierarchy. You know, the capacity to invent and discover obeys no hierarchy at all. So I think a key component of leadership is are you throwing the problems out to enough people? One of the really interesting things in the pandemic has been that it's forced leaders to allow decisions to be made at a local level. And most of them are finding that works much better than actually decentralizing and letting people make decisions on the spot has led to much better decision making. So I think the power to convene multiple voices and allow deep exploration and conflict in the course of that is really fundamental. I think the capacity to pose a great question is a necessary component of leadership. And I think holding a tension between the long-term sense of where are we going and the short-term, what are we going to do today to get towards that? Um, so, so allowing the short term, as we were talking about earlier, allowing the short term and the long term to cohabit and, and not let one dominate, I think is a fundamental requirement of leaders. And also, I have to say, in the uncertainty that we're all facing into, the capacity that artists have, which is to take action before you need to, not to wait. This has been a special edition of the Business of Government Hour a Conversation with Authors series focusing on leading through uncertain times with Margaret Heffernan, author of Uncharted, How to Navigate the Future. Subscribe, download, and listen to the entire interview at Podcast One, iTunes, or on your favorite podcast app, and as always at businessofgovernment.org.